So even if you buy that, there are a number of potential obstacles uh, on the road to that actually playing out as I hypothesized. That is to say, to, to, to the simple extrapolation continuation from what's occurred over the last 80 years actually continuing to, uh, to play out. And so that's what I'm going to focus on here. I'm going to walk through these uh, potential obstacles one by one. So the first is that Americans don't want big government. The second is what Albert Hirschman, a development economist uh, a long time ago, wrote a very clever and insightful book titled The Rhetoric of Reaction. Um, a third is a concern or belief that the left will increasingly struggle to get elected in the United States, which is to some degree a precondition for the past continuing to, to play out in the future. A fourth is that the balance of organized power outside the electoral arena has shifted to the right and may continue to move in that direction. Uh, a fifth, I already hinted at before, is the structure of the US political system makes it very difficult to change policies. And there may be a new wrinkle here having to do with the uh, nature of the modern Republican Party. And then the last uh, concern or potential obstacle is that how are we going to pay for this? We could, of course, just add on all these programs. You know, we could, um, we could uh, pursue the opposite of what the, the part of the Republican strategy has, uh, has been for the last generation, which is that we started the we could add on all these programs and then just assume that later on we'll have to pony up the money to pay for it. Sometimes that's exactly what we do. Um, but I'm going to suggest that at least the mechanics or the technical aspect of raising enough money are very, very simple and easy. Politics are not easy. But, but as a technical matter, it's quite easy to imagine how we might get enough money to pay, not only for the expansion of Social Security and Medicare, but, uh, but some of the other stuff. Okay, so let me walk through these one by one. Start with, starting with Americans not wanting big government. This is a very old refrain. Um, Stephen Martin Lipset was probably the best known scholar of a generation or two ago who made this argument that the United States is exceptional in a number of respects, but one of which is that we're less enamored of big government, more enamored of individualism and, and uh, uh, liberty and so on, and we often see these things in conflict. Uh, the middle book here is, is a kind of clever book that was published about 10 years ago, but two to people who write for The Economist who came over and observed the United States in a very conservative moment, mind you. So this was around 2003, 2004. Um, and the fourth is a book by a couple of economists at Harvard, um, uh, Alberto Alcina and, um, and Ed Blazer, uh, called Fighting Poverty in the US and Europe, where, um, among other things, they present this chart that, that gives a, a one version of this notion that our, so I started with the chart that shows that our government is pretty small compared to most other rich countries. And they say, well, that's mainly because that's what, exactly what the American public wants. And one way of thinking about that is to look at these data. So here, using uh, a cross-national survey called the IS, IS, the acronym is the ISSP, um, they, there's this question called, that, that asks people, um, what do you believe, something along the lines of what do you believe is most influential in determining where people end up or your, uh, your outcome in life? Um, is it your effort, or is it luck, or is it help from others? And so here they're showing the share of uh, respondents in each country that say they believe luck is the most important determinant of your income. And so Denmark is way over here to the right, and here we are, uh, way over here to the left. So about 37 or so percent of Americans say they think luck is the most important determinant. And this correlates pretty well with one kind of crude but not bad measure of the size and scope of social programs. Spending, public spending on social programs is a share of, uh, of GDP. Um, but by now, we have a, 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 a long uh, and pretty well-established, uh, long-standing, pretty well-established notion um, in, in political science and political sociology that what public opinion surveys really show us, and, and I hinted at this earlier as well, is that in the abstract, Americans don't like big government. We're ideologically conservative, as it were, but we're oper operationally or programmatically liberal or progressive. So we like a lot of the stuff that government does. Not everything, but a lot of it. Once it gets put in place, and we can see how it, how it operates. Well, that, that doesn't end this objection or obstacle, because it might be the case that, so even if that's true, it still might be the case that in order to get stuff passed in the first place, you need a kind of groundswell of public support, a lot of public support. And in fact, there's a, a pretty established research finding in political science that says there is a correlation between public support for proposed policy changes and the likelihood of that, of that policy change going into effect. Marty Gillins has a, a nice book which 
uh, adds a very important wrinkle to this, but also reestablishes this basic finding that there is a correlation between the level of public support. At, you know, as best we can glean from the limited uh, questions that are asked in public opinion surveys, and then the subsequent likelihood of the thing getting passed. But in terms of major expansions of social programs, that doesn't seem to be right. So the best thing I know on this is a recent book that I showed here by Kathy Newman uh, and Rourke um, O'Brien that, no, I'm sorry, not Rourke O'Brien. That's a different book that Kathy wrote. This is Elizabeth Jacobs, sorry, um, called Who Cares, where they go back and try as best they can, the public opinion data are really sparse, going all the way back to the New Deal, but they try to look at exactly this question. What do we know about public opinion prior to the big expansions of American social policy? And they don't find anything like that support. Uh, again, it's hard to sort of tease out, but, but at the very least, they conclude that uh, strong public support was in no way, shape, or form a precondition for a lot of the New Deal stuff that got put in place, the Great Society stuff, and, and a, a few other uh, big expansions. And then the, uh, an additional important point, which I alluded to earlier, is this one that Paul Pearson sort of, uh, I think, is most closely identified with, um, uh, which is that once a program gets put into place, if people like it, and as I said before, the, the survey data suggests that Americans often do in the area of social policy, that acts as a break on cutbacks. Uh, this, this, I mean, Pearson argues that this probably happens in all countries, but his particular book, Dismantling the Welfare State, question mark, was about the experience in the 1980s in the UK under Thatcher and the United States under Reagan, where at the end of the day, far fewer cutbacks were actually accomplished than were proposed or feared, uh, depending on the perspective. Okay, 